Aquí lo Well, we're very happy to come for you guys to be here. This is the second to last session of the whole conference, so it's great to see um, all of you here. We have a very modern presentation today, very contemporary, because it's going to be via Skype, so we hope this is successful, and bear with us if we have some technical issues, and I'm told that everything's been tried out. So, uh, what are you doing right now? Ah, uh, okay, it's interfering. Anyway, the speaker is Kevin Land. We have a big name for you. Where is he? There he is, if you want to see him. Anyway, he will have, he will present what seems to be a very, very interesting talk. Do we perceive perspectival properties? He's from the University of California at LA, as you can all see. And then he'll be speaking for about for maximum 45 minutes. And then Javier Godoy, our own Javier Godoy, from the um, postgraduate program in philosophy here, will be giving some comments for around 10 to 15 minutes. So I'm Kevin's going to time himself so that we don't do awkward interruptions. So I'm sure he'll stick to it. But if he doesn't, uh, 45 minutes, I'll just cut you off mid sentence. Okay, so please start, Kevin. Uh, thank you all for coming to this talk. I'm very sorry that I couldn't be there in person. I was caught up by an emergency. Um, and now I'm sitting in an unfurnished room, so it might be a bit echoey. And I'm sitting on the floor, actually on the dog bed on the floor, so I might shift around a bit. Um, so my talk is on the perspectival character of perception. Before we get to the handout, I just want to set some things up. Um, perception, I think, is perspectival. Um, and the key way that this can be brought out is by looking at a coin that's planted away from you in depth. This planted coin looks different from a head-on coin. And in some respects, you might even say the slanted coin looks elliptical, even though you perceive it as circular, in fact. So intuitively, the puzzle, or a puzzle, behind the perspectival character of perception is this. We're able to see the coin as circular, from just about any angle. You can see how the coin actually is. So why should our perception of the coin's circularity be different as we rotate it? instead of there being a single canonical percept of the coin's circularity? And why should our perception of the slanted coin be similar at all to our perception of a different shape, like an ellipse? How can we explain the perspectival character of perception? In this talk, I want to evaluate two different attempts to explain the perspectival character of perception. There's a very brief overview. First, I'll describe two important effects of the perspectival character of perception, especially as they're brought out by looking at slanted coins. An adequate account of the perspectival character of perception should explain both of these effects. Uh, second, I'll describe what I call the perspectival properties approach to explaining these effects. This approach hypothesizes that we represent some unified kind of specifically perspectival properties and that our representations of these properties are relatively basic and distinct from our re representations of properties like size, shape, and egocentric rotation. It's our representations of these perspectival properties which is supposed to explain perspectival character of perception. I'm going to argue that this approach is incorrect. I'm going to argue that a better type of account says that the perspectival character of perception depends on our perception of a variety of different kinds of properties. I'll call this the egocentric properties approach. Um, if this approach is right, then the perspectival character of perception doesn't have a unified explanation in terms of a basic unified kind of psychological representation. If there's time, I might mention that I think that there's room for a third alternative, third approach to explaining the perspectival character of perception, an approach which doesn't appeal to what sorts of properties are represented in experience but instead appeals to the structure of or format of perceptual representations. Okay, so let's get into it. Uh, let's 
was now in section one of the handout. Uh, the perspectival character of perception is typically characterized in terms of two main effects. The first effect I'll call variance or perspectival variance. This is roughly the effect that the slanted coin or the slanted disc looks different from this head-on coin. You might say an accurate experience of the slanted circular coin and a fully accurate experience of a head-on circular coin will be different in kind. The second effect I'll call perspectival similarity or dissimilarity. This is roughly the effect that the slanted coin looks elliptical in some respects. Whereas I'll put it, an accurate experience of a slanted circular coin and an accurate experience of a head-on ellipse will be similar at times. Perspectival variance and similarity um, also characterize color and lightness perception. So in the case of the slanted coin, we're mainly talking about shape perception. The shaded patch of graph looks different from the unshaded patch. Our experience, a fully accurate experience of the shaded patch of grass is different in time from a fully accurate experience of the unshaded patch. Even though we perceive them, those two patches of grass as being the same color and white. So this is an example of similarity, perspective of similarity in color or light perception. The shaded patch of grass, you might also say, looks darker than the unshaded patch, even though you perceive them as being actually the same shade. Or you might say that the shaded patch of grass, our experience of the shaded patch of grass is similar in some kinds to our experience of an unshaded, darker grass. So this is perspectival similarity for color and lightness perception. So, Perception exhibits perspectival variance and similarity, these two effects of the perspectival character of perception. It exhibits it in the phenomenal character of our experiences, that is, what it is like to see the slanted disc is different than what it's like to see the head-on disc, and what it's like to see the slanted disc is similar to what it's like to see the head-on ellipse. But in addition, I'm going to assume for the purposes of this talk, that perceptual representation is perspectival. So let me say what I mean by this. First of all, I assume that perception is representational. Perceptual experiences carry content about how the world is, about the shapes, sizes, and colors of objects in the world. For example, my current perceptual experience represents the small table in front of me as rectangular and brown. Perceptual experiences are accurate just in case the world is the way they rep the way the experience represents the world as being, just in case the table in front of me is rectangular and brown and so on. And we can speak of perceptual experiences as having representational properties, that is, properties that are representation over representation that are essential to its representing what it does. So one representational property of my current experience is that it represents a rectangular brown shape. Other properties of represent, representational properties might include syntactic structure. So, a representational property of a sentence might be included in syntactic structure. So, we can go back. So, I'm going to assume that perception is representationally perspectival. And this means we can go back and formulate perspectival variance and similarity. Again, variance is the effect that an accurate experience of a slanted circular coin and an accurate experience of a head-on circular coin will have relatively distinct representational properties. Similarity can, again, be formulated. An accurate experience of a slanted circular coin and an accurate experience of a head-on ellipse will share relevant representational properties. Now, there's a deep a uh, controversial question in the philosophy of mind whether the phenomenal character of an experience, what it's like to be in, to have that experience, can be fully explained in terms of the representational properties of that experience, what's involved in representing the world through that experience. Um, and one of the key issues here is whether perception is, in addition to being phenomenally perspectival, if, whether perception is also representationally perspectival. 
I'm just going to assume that perception is representationally perspectival, um, although I want to just stay neutral about these broader questions about phenomenal character experience and how it relates to representation. So, I take it that an adequate account to explaining the perspectival character of perception should explain how perceptual representation exhibits variance and exhibits similarity. It should explain how our percept or experience of the front of this is different in its representational properties from our percept of the head of this, and how it's similar in its representational properties to our experience or percept of the head of the lips. I think there are two main approaches to explaining these effects, to explaining variance and similarity. The first approach I'll call the perspectival properties approach. This is again on your handout. According to this approach, perspectival effects depend on our perceptually representing some special set of, call, I'll call them, perspectival properties. The representations of these properties are supposed to be unified and based form a unified and basic psychological kind. Um, perspectival properties can receive different kinds of characterization. Some people characterize them as dispositional properties or properties that objects have in virtue of being disposed to generate certain kinds of experiences. Um, I'll look later at an account on which a what a perspectival property is, is it's a projective property, the property of projecting a certain kind of image. Perspectival properties are intended to be a unified, distinctive natural kind, different from intrinsic properties like shape and size, and different from even relational properties like the egocentric location or the location an object has relative to the perceiver. That's what the egocentric location is. Perspectival properties are not mentioned in existing perceptual psychology. They're novel class of properties that are typically the main function or, or role is to explain the perspectival character of perception. That's why they're positive. In contrast to the perspectival properties approach, or PPA, is what I'll call the egocentric properties approach, or EPA. According to this approach, perspectival effects, variance and similarity, depend on our perceptually representing some egocentric properties, I'll call them. Examples of which are surface orientation, egocentric direction, egocentric distance, surface luminance. These representations don't form a, a basic explanatory kind and they, they might not be unified. Sorry. These representations don't form an explanatorily unified kind. Even though I'm giving a common name to all these properties, I'm calling them all egocentric properties, there isn't ex any explanatorily significant feature unifying the properties of surface orientation, that is, how something is slanted with respect to your line of sight, and the property of surface luminance, that is, the amount of light being reflected from a surface. There's no deep common nature between those. So, according, so it may well turn out on the egocentric properties approach that the perspectival character of perception is grounded in uh, distinct perceptual capacity that the perspectival character of spatial perception is grounded in a distinct psychological capacity than the perspectival color character of color or lightness perception. And it may well turn out that the perspectival character of perception isn't grounded in anything psychologically basic, but is rather grounded in a set of specific derivative subcapacities. I'm going to argue that the perspectival properties approach is not a good account that the egocentric properties approach is a better account. I'm not sure it's the best they have, but I think it's the better of the predominant approaches that have been offered. Before I argue against the perspective of properties approach, I just want to flesh it out in a little more detail. So now we're on section two of your handout. There are many different versions of the perspective of properties approach. They all typically include the following three types of claims. The first claim, the properties thesis, is roughly just the claim that there are perspectival properties and that objects instantiate them. The second claim, the representation thesis, is that 
if one's in a representational perceptual state, then one is in a state of perceptually representing a perspectival property. That is, we pervasively represent perspectival properties. If you see a desk as rectangular or brown, you also see it as having certain kinds of perspectival properties. The third thesis, the dependent thesis, is the claim that our perceptual representation of non perspectival properties, regular old properties like shape and size, depends in some way on our perceptual representations of perspectival properties. Now, like I said, there are different versions of the perspectival properties approach. And they differ depending on, for example, how you characterize perspective problems, what sort of properties you take these to be. And they differ on what kind of dependence relations you this estimate. How you think our perception of shape and size, for example, depends on our perception of perspective shape and perspective size. Um, some, some claim that there's an epistemic dependence here. Some claim that there's just a computational dependence. And some even claim that our perception of shape and size constitutively depends on our perception of perspectival shape and perspectival size. Now, as far as arguments against the perspectival properties approach, many people have attacked the properties thesis. They just think that all the different things that people claim perspectival properties are couldn't be genuine properties. It's sort of metaphysical dispute about what sort of properties exist in the world. Others have attacked the dependence thesis. They claim that even if we do represent perspectival properties, it can't be that our representations of shape and size depend on them. It can't be that they're, for example, computationally depend on our representations of perspectival properties. What I want to do here is pose an objection to the representation thesis. In fact, I want to argue that it's implausible to say that we represent perspectival properties at all. Now, in order to make this argument, it's going to be useful to have a model account of what a perspectival property is. So far, I've just given them a name. What many people do is they just sort of say how perspectival properties differ as a general class from other sorts of properties, like intrinsic properties like shape and size. Some people will say perspectival properties are dispositional. They are dispositions to produce certain sorts of experiences. And that perspectival properties are centered functions from one's context to an extension. What I want to do, and part of the objection, is going to look at um, accounts on which you give complete, uh, complete accounts for perspectival properties are. What I want from the complete accounts of the perspectival properties is that it should give individuation conditions for particular perspectival properties. It should tell us how perspectival ellipticality differs from perspectival rhomboidal, rhomboidal, rhomboidalness. Very difficult to say. It should not just tell us how, as a class, perspectival properties differ from other kinds of properties. It should tell us what particular perspectival properties are. I think one of the best um, accounts, along, sort of complete accounts of perspectival properties, is a projective account. And this is a sort of account that's been offered by Alvin Noe in his book Action and Perception. It's been offered at points by Michael Humer in his book The Veil of Experience. So, roughly, the idea is perspectival properties are projective properties. And what a projective property is, it's a property that an object has just in case it projects a certain kind of image. Uh, more precisely, and I have this on your handout, we'll say that an object X is projectively F relative to a viewpoint of E in a projection plane P. If the optical projection of X onto P relative to V has a property of being F. So that's a lot of variables, but you can give an easy example in the figure on your handout. The slanted disk, which is in fact circular, is projectively elliptical relative to the viewpoint and projection plane I've drawn because its image on the projection plane is elliptical. And the head on ellipse is also projectively elliptical because its projection onto the projection plane relative to the viewpoint I've drawn is also elliptical. 
So objects are projectively elliptical just in case their projections are elliptical. And just for ease of speaking, we can um, suppress reference to particular viewpoints and projection planes to say, relative to some salient viewpoints and projection planes, the slanted coin is projectively elliptical, the head on coin is projectively elliptical as well. I'll suppose that the relevant concepts of projection of what the viewpoint is and of the nature of the projection plane can be fixed by the laws of physical optics and by the anatomy of the relevant sensory organ. The notion of a projective property can generalize to non-spatial cases. For example, you can define projective color and lightness. It's just object has a projective color if its projection has a certain color. And you can even generalize the notion of projective property um, to carry over to non-visual cases, for example, projective pitch in here. So what we have here is a unified class of properties, each of which can be specified in the same canonical form. Representations of these properties would be quite distinctive and different in time from representations of shape and size, color, and such representations would seem to wouldn't obviously depend on capacities to represent the crystal objects' intrinsic shape, size, or location. So the representations of projective properties, if we had them, would seem to be relatively basic psychological kinds, and they would be a unified psychological kind. It's easy to see how representations of projective properties can explain a variance in similarity. The head-on point is projectively circular, is perceived to be projectively circular, whereas the slanted coin is perceived to be projectively elliptical, that's variance. The slanted coin is perceived to be projectively elliptical, so is the head on ellipse, that gets you somewhere. So the accounts here, this is the version of the perspectival properties approach we have here, is that we represent projective properties, and that explains representational variance and similarity. Now I'm going to argue that there's a problem with the perspective properties approach. I'm going to argue it in particular with respect to this projective characterization of projective properties, perspective properties, but I also think it carries over to non-projective characterizations, for example, dispositional accounts. We, we can talk about that more in the Q&A. But the objection is going to be especially clear for the projective accounts. So moving into section three, the problem with the perspective properties approach, especially this projective characterization. Now, the ultimate test, before I say move into section three, actually, I should say the ultimate test of the right account of the perspective character perception will be to look at what empirical predictions it makes about our behavior in different sorts of experimental conditions. The debate and philosophy over how to explain the perspectival character of perception has largely neglected this question of the empirical predictions. Um, but all the accounts that we're giving, the, the accounts that I have just sketched out for you that we represent projective properties, are really empirical hypotheses about what our psychology is like. What I want to do is I want to give some theoretical reasons for thinking that the perspectival properties approach is a bad empirical hypothesis about what our psychology is like. So the problem, now looking at section three, the problem for the perspectival properties approach in a nutshell is that representations of perspectival properties would be functionally redundant. And again, I think this is especially clear for a projective property version of the view. So the basic idea is this. The architecture of the perceptual system is just set up to presuppose um, to presuppose that the input image, the array of light that hits the retina, is projected from a distal scene according to the laws of optics. That is, the perceptual system is set up to assume that the incoming image is a projection from the distal scene. This is just built into the, hard, the hardware, you might say, into computational operations performed by the perceptual system, 
So there's no reason to specifically represent each state as projected in the input image. There's no reason to token particular perceptual states that represent objects as projecting the input image. So let me put this point in the context of the role that natural constraints play in perception. So turning to one, certain regularities, or we'll call them natural constraints, are reflected in the architecture of the perception system, which automatically operates as if those regularities always hold. For example, one such regularity, or natural constraint, is that moving bodies maintain their shape as they move. This is known as the rigidity constraint. Um, the standard view in perceptual psychology, or the standard approach, is that through evolutionary or individual development, the computations in the perceptual system become set up to produce representations that are approximately accurate when those regularities hold, might be inaccurate when the regularities don't hold. So basically what it means to say that um, a certain regularity is reflected in the architecture of the perceptual system is that the operations that the perceptual system performs on the sensory inputs are such that will produce representations of the world that are accurate when the regularity holds and might turn out to be inaccurate when the regularity doesn't hold. There's no representation in the case of the regularities. It's just that the perceptual system carries out its operations as if those regularities hold. Since the system, this is number two, since the system is structured to operate as if those regularities hold, there's no functional benefit to specifically representing those regularities as holding in particular states. In other words, the architecture is already built to only output representations that accord with these regularities, so there's no need to represent the regularities as such. Among these regularities are natural constraints is the regularity that the retinal image, the input to vision, is projected from a distal scene according to the laws of optics. So again, the perceptual system will just take an input retinal image, a visual input, and it will perform its operations to produce representations of the distal scene as if the distal scene were, were what projected the retinal image. That's just hard encoded into the architecture of the system. So there's no functional benefit to representing particular scenes as projecting particular retinal images. There's no functional benefit to representing scenes as having projective properties. If you have an input image with an elliptical pattern, the architecture will produce a representation of some sort of object that could have produced that elliptical pattern, that could have projected it, and there's no need to transition into a particular state which represents the object as having that projective property. The system does that work for you. Now, I think that all things being equal, we should avoid positing functionally redundant psychological representations, representations that don't make any contribution to information processing in the perceptual system. So all things being equal, we should avoid posting representations of projective properties because they don't do anything over and above what's already guaranteed by the architecture of the perceptual system, by the computate, by the structure of the computations that the perceptual system carries out. Now, I think this argument that representations of projective properties are functionally redundant visual information processing generalizes to other non-projective characterizations with respect to other properties. We can talk more about that in questions. So I think it there's a big problem to the respect to properties approach. It posits representational capacity that don't do any that don't make any contribution to visual information processing given what we already know about how the visual system is set up. Is there any overriding reason to think that we represent perspectival problems? That is, the conclusion was all things being equal, we should not adopt, the, we, sh we shouldn't think that we represent these properties, because that would mean to posit functionally redundant capacities. But maybe all things aren't equal, and we are compelled to adopt this view. 
So in section four of the handout, I consider the two main arguments that have been offered um, to motivate the prospect out of properties approach. And I think they don't favor over the alternative approach, what I call the egocentric properties approach, which can, which can satisfy these arguments without causing functionally redundant psychological representations. So the main, the, the two arguments are called slanted coin arguments, they center around the slanted coin, and then they stem from variance, the phenomenon of variance, and the phenomenon of similarity. So the first argument is argument for variance. So throughout, we'll assume that you're perceiving every same fully accurate and in normal conditions. The argument from variance goes something like this. This is an argument that's supposed to be for the perspective agile properties approach. First, there's some respect in which your perception of the slanted coin representationally differs from your perception of the head-on coin. This just states, again, that perspective agile variance is real. The second claim is that the best explanation for this representational difference is that you represent the slanted coin and the head-on coin as having some different property. That is, a representational difference is best explained by a difference in what properties you represent. I don't actually think that's right, but I think most people assume that in this debate. The third premise is that you represent all the same relevant intrinsic properties as being had by the head-on disk and the slanted disk. You perceive them both as circular, you perceive them both as solid and have been bounded by closed contours and so on. And so because you represent all these same intrinsic properties, it can't be a representation of those intrinsic properties that accounts for the difference. So it must be that you represent some non-intrinsic property differently when seeing the head-on coin and the slanted coin. And so the argument goes, the best explanation is that you represent a different perspective that will shape. Perceives the head on disk is projectively circular and the slant of disk is projectively elliptical. Now, the question is whether this is the best explanation. We already saw an initial objection to the claim that we represent perspectival properties, which is that such representations would be functionally redundant. They would play no role in visual information processing. So, it seems like a better explanation would be one that could explain the variance. Um, but did posit functionally redundant psychological representations. Now, the egocentric properties approach, the main alternative approach, can appeal to give such an explanation. It says, we perceive the slanted disk as slanted, we perceive the head on disk as head on, that is, we perceive slants, we perceive them differently in the two cases, therefore, there's a representational difference. And it's not functionally redundant because there's a great deal of research so that representations of slants contribute a lot of information to the visual system. They play important roles in perception of shape and many other things. So it looks like you have a better explanation of variance, one that appeals to perceived slant. Now, a response from the perspective of the properties approach seems to be available, which is that the perception of slant doesn't explain the right kind of variance, it doesn't explain the relevant phenomena. In particular, it doesn't explain the way in which the slanted disk, but not the head-on disk, looks elliptical. This is affecting effects, um, putting all the weight for the perspectival properties approach, for motivating it, on perspectival similarity. So let's turn to the next argument, the argument from similarity. So there's, so let, let me first say why perception of slant isn't going to explain respect to similarity. You see the slanted disc is slanted, you see the head-on ellipse is head-on, those are different slant properties, so they're not going to get you the representational similarity that you're looking for. So the argument from similarity goes, there's some respect in which your perception of the slanted coin, but not of the head-on coin, is representationally similar to your perception of the head-on ellipse. So the slanted, the perception of the slanted coin 
reputationally so much when you're pushed up with the head on a lips. And that similarity is slant specific. As you rotate the coin further, and you turn it, rotate it to the head on, that similarity disappears. So notice that this premise actually implies some variance, implies that variance must be the case. That the perceptive of the head on disc is different from your perceptive of the slanted disc. In particular, because your perceptive of the slanted disc is similar to the ellipse in the way that your perceptive of the head on disc isn't. So again, the first premise is you're, there's some similarity between your experience of the slanted disc and of the head on ellipse. The second premise is that the best explanation for the similarity, again, is that you represent the head on ellipse in the slanted coin as having some similar properties. But, and this is premise three, all the intrinsic properties that you perceive the slanted coin and the head on ellipse as having, you also perceive the head on coin as having. So, consider all the intrinsic properties. Um, you perceive the slanted disc and the head on ellipse as being solid and bounded by a closed contour, but you also perceive the head on disc as being solid and bounded by a closed contour. So even though you perceive all these sorts of intrinsic similarities between the slanted disc and the head on ellipse, um, they're not relevant to explaining perspectival similarity. So there must be some non-intrinsic property that you represent when you perceive the slanted coin and the head on ellipse but which you don't represent when you perceive the head on them. And so the argument goes, the best explanation is that what you're representing here is perspectival shape. You're representing the slanted disc and the head on ellipse as projectively or perspectively elliptical. You don't perceive the circle that way. You don't perceive the head on point. Now again, the egocentric properties approach can't appeal to slant to explain the similarity because the head on ellipse is perceived as head on and the slant, slanted coin is perceived as slanted and those are different. And you can appeal to other sorts of egocentric properties, um, other sorts of well-known spatial properties. You can, in particular, appeal to your perception of higher order relations among egocentric directions. So egocentric direction, that's the direction that an object is relative to your viewpoint. Um, it can be sort of illustrated just by pointing somewhere, and that's the direction from your shoulder to that object. Um, there are various sort of, now it's well known that we represent egocentric direction, so established part of perception psychology. Um, it's even thought that we represent visual angle or angular size. So roughly the visual angle or angular size of an object is the difference or angle between the two directions namely between the direction from one point to an opposite point on the object. So this is a relation among egocentric directions. It might even be that we represent angular shape. Angular shape is just the set of all angular sizes for every pair of opposing points on an object. So you can just roughly, to get the idea of this, point to a table or to the projector that you're looking at, and sort of trace this outline with your fingers, and that's going to give you the relative set of directions to from your shoulder to all the points on the outline of the projector screen. So think of that as angular shape. Now, the slanted coin has the same angular shape as the head on ellipse. So if you're pointing your finger around the outline of the slanted disc, you're going to trace out the same path in the air as you will if you point your finger around the outline of the head on the lips. The set relative set of directions to the edges of the coin when it's slanted, the same set of directions to the edge of the head on the lips. So it seems like we could explain projective simul we could explain perspectival similarity in terms of our in terms of hypothetical representations of angular shape or relations along the egocentric direction. Furthermore, representations of angular properties, angular size and shape, don't seem to be functionally redundant. Representations of angular size contribute um, to visual information processing, and so do 
wood representations of angular shape. So you can imagine seeing a charging bolt coming, charging head on. You look at one, you look at one or maybe the right horn, the representation of the visual angle or difference between the direction to the right horn and the left horn is going to predict the amount of uh, the amount that your eyes have to reorient to propagate from one horn to the other horn. So angular size is going to carry information about how you orient yourself um, to different sides of an object. An angular shape is going to carry information about how you should you know, orient yourself to any arbitrary point on the object and how you should even manipulate it. So it seems that the hypothesis that would represent angular shape and size uh, could explain perspectival variance and similarity. The slanted coin has a different angular shape than head on coin and the same angular shape as a head on ellipse. But representations of angular properties or these relations among egocentric directions um, are egocentric representations. Um, they're not suited to be per being perspectival properties. They're not suited to do what the perspectival properties approach wants to do um, for two reasons, which I explain on section five of the handout. Effectively, an explanation of uh, perspectival variance and similarity in terms of angular properties offers a deflationary view of what perspectival representation is. If perspectival spatial representation is grounded in the representation of relations among egocentric directions, that is, the relation between the directions to different parts of the coin, then our capacity to represent these relations is dependent on a more basic capacity to represent egocentric directions and more basically represent where things are located in space relative to us. Our representations of angular properties wouldn't be a basic psychological kind of capacity. It would be a derivative subcapacity of our general capacity to represent where things are directed. This is in contrast to the main explanatory strategy of the perspectival properties approach, which wants to explain the perspectival character of perception as grounded in some basic psychological kind. Second, the perception of relations among egocentric directions could not explain perspectival variance and similarity in color or lightness perception in non-spatial cases. Um, so, Again, there's, there's, no, there's no appeal to representations of angular shapes, which is going to explain why our perception of the shaded patch of grass looks different from, our, from the unshaded patch, or why it looks similar to an unshaded but darker patch of grass. So maybe what matters here is something like the property of surface luminance. Surface luminance is the total amount of light that a surface reflects. Um, given the illumination, the lighting condition would give the reflectance and color of the surface. But maybe perception of surface luminance explains variance and similarity for color perception. But there's no important deep uh, commonality between the properties of surface luminance and angular shape, except maybe that they both explain perspectival variance and similarity in some cases. There's no deep explanatory unity to these properties. Doesn't seem, and representations of these properties would seem to depend on very different kinds of computational operations and psychological capacities. So the capacities would seem to be quite different in kind. So this approach where we appeal to angular properties to explain the perspectival variance and similarity in the coin case will seem to explain the perspectival character of perception as being grounded in some psychologically derivative set of capacities and as being grounded in a disunified set of capacities. So it might turn out, according to this approach, the egocentric properties approach, that the perspectival character of perception doesn't constitute a basic or unified psychological kind. It doesn't receive a unified expl general explanation. 
This is quite in contrast to the perspectival properties approach. So what it looks like is that the main approach which offered to give a unified account of the perspectival character perception in terms of some basic psychological capacity is saddled with positive functionally redundant psychological capacities, capacities that don't do anything for the visual system. And all things being equal, we shouldn't adopt an account that posits functionally redundant capacities. The best explanation available between these two accounts for explaining perspective invariance and similarity appeals to the representations of angular properties in order to explain why the coin will looks different when slanted than head on, and why it looks elliptical when slanted. But this sort of explanation isn't going to generalize to, to the perspectival character of color or lightness perception. You're going to have to come up with some other explanation there. And that explanation doesn't even appeal to any sort of basic psychological capacities, it appeals to some quite specific subcapacities. So it looks like the best explanation that we have in perspective the various Similarity, the best explanation we have so far of the perspectival character of perception, one that doesn't appeal to functionally redundant positive, is a, dis is a disunified uh, explanation. It gives a deflationary view of the perspectival character's representation. So that leaves us with a question Is there any reason then to think that there's a unified general explanation of the perspectival character of perception? Uh, I think there might be, but since I have seven seconds left, I can't go into it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, um, Kevin, and thank you for keeping to the time. I wasn't quite sure whether you were going to do it, but you did. Brilliant. So, Javier will, will give um, 10 to 15 minute comments. 15 minutes? 15 minutes, that's fine. Do you want to, if you want to sit there, then I'll turn this round. So that he can see you. And we'll Thank you. Oh, we'll you have slides? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, no. I'm just, I'm just gonna talk. Just let us know. Kevin. Kevin, if you can't hear him for any reason, just let us know. Okay, great. Okay, great. Okay, Thanks. good afternoon to everybody. Well, some remarks. This is my first time that I am giving a lecture in English, so be kind or gentle if I have some grammatical or kind of uh, language errors. But I will. I think that it will not be very important to the content of my of my lecture of my work directly in this, this occasion. Okay, um, uh, I was prepared for 30 minutes, but I will short it. Come okay. And um, the main issue in the paper exposed by Kevin Lenn is the question about what's our best strategy to, for explaining the perspectival character of perception. In the market, we combine one of the two strategies chosen by the author, the perspectival properties approach, PPA, and the egocentric properties approach, EPA. These two strategies differ elementally in what's nature of, of perspectival properties. While PPA claim that perspectival properties are different in kind compared with intrinsic properties and egocentric properties, EPA states that perspectival properties are a subset of egocentric properties. Nance's characterization of PPA follows Noé's loose definition of perspectival property, understanding it understanding it as a projective property. In a first movement, Land argues in favor of the EPA theory. Well, and it was the only movement because I think that he didn't mention the, a part that I wrote or a week in, in the paper that he sent me, but it's okay. Um, the main argument for this standing is a negative one. Following PPA leader leads us to posit redundant functional representations in our visual perceptual system. In the opposite side, EPA proposal not defining perspectival properties in terms of projections. It does in virtue of egocentric properties like egocentric direction, angular shape, etc. 
The property or relation represented change depending if you are explaining the phenomenon of perspectival variance or the phenomenon of perspectival similarity. The most important thing here is that, like egocentric properties are not defined in terms of projectiles on a plane, the psychological information represented won't be functionally redundant or won't be functionally redundant. And um, the second movement. I don't know if I should say about something about your structure proposal. We don't have to. Well, and I didn't get into it in the time constraints. <laughs> um, well, having already summed up broadly Lance's text, I will divide my, my reply in three parts. First, I will agree with Lenz's view when he says that information represented by projected properties is functionally redundant if we have in mind Noah's definition of respectable properties and Mars' framework about the nature of visual perceptual system. But the problem is that Noé is a Gibsonian respect to how perceptual systems have to be defined. This has two major implications for Lenz's analysis. One, in Gibsonian approaches to perception, the natural constraints by which perceptual processes are settled has little to do with things like projective geometry and general loss of objects. In Gibson's theory of visual perception, the properties represented are affordances, knowledge of sensory motor contingencies occurring between the subject and the environment in noise method. So information represented is broad compared with optics or geometry. Information given by the structure and the physical features of visual perceptual system includes information about all relevant possibilities of action in the visual array. Two, the category of perceptual system is a dynamic one. Examples given by Gibson and Noel illustrate visual systems like complexes that include body parts like the head, the neck, the feet, and all other parts that has a role in facilitating a specific perceptual situation. Ecological approach to visual perception is a part of the framework pretended by Noël. Then, my first critic is that the reason of why projective properties seem to represent information that is already implicit in the natural, phylogenetical, or ontogenetical constraints of visual perceptual system is because Noël's definition of perspectival properties assumes another kind of framework, an inactive one. Aside my disagreement with certain aspects of Noël's methodology, the motivation of this criticism is one of correct. Looking for a specific type of individual condition for perspectival properties, Land, Land Kane dismissed other characterizations of perspectival properties in the PPA step, like Egan's or Schalberg. Um, the latter, um, Egan's, for example, defines perspectival properties in terms of centered functions. Uh, nonetheless, Lance believes that just Noé's definition in terms of projections on a plane meet the three conditions for a complete characterization of perspective properties. One is that uh, provide individuation conditions for particular perspective properties. Two, distinguish between perspective properties and intrinsic properties such as size and shape. And three, distinguish between perspective properties and what I will call Egocentric properties such as surface orientation and spatial location relative to a viewpoint, and uh, that was a problem. Um, in spite of the possibility of being redundant, I will quote Lenz's paraphrase of Noé's definition of projective properties one more time. I think that is in the handout. Um, in the so I will not say it again. So, given this, all that I have said already, I will learn that implication one or two that I have already said can have two different interpretations. Interpretation A, if we stand with noise complete proposal, there is no reason to think that information represented by the psychological capacities is redundant. Projective, projective properties contain information about the possibility of actions that the visual array gives. I will argue this uh, um, in the next section. And interpretation B, the combined Noé and Mar approach could still be interpreted, inter 
interpreted like redundant if we attain to land view. But EPA, egocentric properties approach, is not ex excluded of the same critique if egocentric properties are conceived like knowledge of sensorimotor contingencies, contingencies too. Applying noise and active framework about perceptual systems to EPA approach, representations of egocentric properties like surface orientation or angular shapes would have for content information about the sensory motor contingencies of the, of the individual with respect to his environment. Information available for visual perceptual system includes information from other modalities and motor systems. So, a property or relation like surface orientation can be defined in an inactive way. Uh, saying that surface orientation is nothing else than a set of public expectations, like Nara says, that determines possibilities of behaviors, affordances, in virtue of a given context. Assuming that surface orientation is a knowledge that has been fixed by evolutionary processes, it has to be represented implicitly in a broad and inactive visual system, just like loss of optics or projective geometry. I think B, the B uh, interpretation, is not a gentle critic. B is not a gentle critic in the sense that the, uh, the strategy that it uses is the same that I was criticizing before. I am changing the framework where the explanation of perspectival perception is settled. So I will stand with A critic and R that noise definition of, of respectival properties accommodated to his own inactive framework has no need to posit functionally relevant psychological capacities. Aside, a difference of the proponents of centered functions or other kind of functions to determine the content of respectival properties could work. But Glenn doesn't argue against them in his text. Um, so I hope that if someone is sympathetic with this kind of approach and is in the audience today, can make some comments. Um, secondly, I will face that it will be the most popular counter-argument for the noise framework, net blocks distinction between constituency and causality. Although it could be thought that this is not a necessary <coughs> step to follow in this roughly, I would like to take this opportunity to vindicate some aspects of noise theory and disagree with others. It won't be long, I promise. Next, I will expose my own opinion about what's the best way it looks to explain the perspective of character of perception. Finally, uh, well, uh, I, I had some remarks about uh, another lens proposed, but that doesn't matter now. So, uh, perception is perspectival. This is one of Kevin Lenz's starting assertions. To sum up very quickly, if we have a coin in front of us, we can be aware of two things. The perception of the coin differs in some respect as it's rotated. I mean that the head coin looks different from the slanted coin. The perception of the coin from an angle is similar to the perception of a head on ellipse. I mean that the perceptual state that, so, that subject has but perceives a slanted coin shares a common feature or trait with the perceptual state that the subject has but perceives a head on lips. Excuse me. So, if we have the objective to give uh, an adequate explanation of perspective of the character of perception, that explanation should explain this phenomena of variance and similarity. The two candidate theories to explain this phenomena are PPA and EPA. Um, I will see this. Um, PPA fundamental characteristic is that it postulates perspectival properties being natural different from intrinsic properties and egocentric properties. In this respect, its noise definition which is chosen to represent PPA standing. Noe is maybe one of the most well-known inactivists that can be found in psychological literature today, among others, like Hu, Domin, and Oregon. In perceptual and action, Noe pretends to establish a new framework in which perception and perceptual experience can be explained. This attempt is construed using as a methodology the works of the past century psychologist James um, G. J. Gibson, who has one of the first that uh, was one of the first that had the insight of perception of being proactive. 
properties perceived in this respect are possibilities for acting. So they determine or constitute a specific knowledge about sensory motor, sensory motor contingencies of the perceiver. Setting anti-representationalism anti aside, noise vision, about is, uh, noise vision uh, about perception is pretty faithful to Gibson thinking. Also, in several parts of his book, he repeats things like, and here I'm quoting, our ability to perceive not only depends on, but is constituted by our possession of this sort of sensory motor knowledge. What is important for actual discussion is that noise and active view is not only challenging for internism, it's also challenging for modularity. Noise describes perception as a skillful activity on the part of the animal as a whole, inviting, inviting us to consider that boundaries of modern perceptual systems are more methodological than, and contingent than metaphysical and necessary. With this in view, noise definition of, of perspectival properties as projections on a plane has to be understood inside an, a model characterization of perspective. Information provided by perspective properties is not just visual coordinates, so infor um, it's information represent in uh, so information represented in psychological capacities is about possibilities of action. One can still be tempted to say that information represented is functionally redundant, but now the redundant information must be wide and constraints provided by projective geometry or loss of optics. Projective geometry and loss of optics are too narrow to include possibilities of action, so there is information that is represented in psychological capacities that is not given by visual system destruction. Until here, I was arguing in a form that I think Noel will do it will do if he were me in this discussion. Now I'll take a short try to respond to Bloch's critique in the review of Noel's book Perception in Action. Maybe this has least little to do with the main issue of this discussion. I mean the perspective of character. I will pass the, <laughs> the part of the exposition and I will just say my own view about the perspective of character of people perception. Um, following what I was saying just before, <laughs> perception <laughs> is a phenomenon that has to be explained methodologically. In this very sense, I agree with Len that egocentric properties are a better choice to explain perspective than projective properties. I think this because I also agree with Bloch uh, when, when he said that noise description of perceptual processes are too ambiguous. Noe can't express himself clearly about what knowledge of sensory motor its quantities is or if the processes needed for perception are the same that are needed for perceptual experience. Even his definition of projective properties seems sometimes too much visual in comparison with his radical claim that perception is a skillful process of the whole body. Egocentric properties haven't changed the characteristic of being determined for a point of view. Egocentric direction, surface orientation, and angular size are relations, and only this kind of properties can be dynamical and non-static. In fact, what is hard to support from an active perspective is the existence of intrinsic properties. Um, from an ecological point of view, all relevant properties represented by our psychological capacities should be relations because just they keep some kind of nexus with the perceiver. So they represent, so they represent relevant information for heavy behavior. Someone com could possibly say that this point, uh, at this point, that representing no intrusive properties is like representing no object. Variance can be explained, but similarity not. But this is not quite right. For example, perspectival difference between a heron coin and a slanted coin can be explained in terms of surface orientation and that can include some description of possibilities of action. But the similarity is easy to explain in terms of behavior and cultural constraints. Heron coin and slanted coin share the very same property that makes the receiver wanting to grab them when he found them on the floor. Block uh, doesn't hit the target, I'm going to finish now. Block doesn't hit the target when he critics this characterization saying that it's an easy and behaviorist path to solve the explanatory gap. Actually, 
behaviorist explanation is short because they don't care about the social and cultural nature of behavior. To conclude, my style about perspective and character of perception can be resumed like this. One, our visual systems do represent perspective properties. Two, properties are perspective because they are relations of the perceiver with the environment features. Three, like egocentric properties, but like egocentric properties, perspective properties represent information about the visual array depending on a, on a viewpoint. Four, perception is a skillful and a model processes. And five, whatever represented by visual system has information about possibilities of action given by a visual array and a point of view. In this sense, I could agree with proposals of centered, func of centered functions for determining the content of visual representations. In fact, I think that functions are closer to authentic properties than to predictive or perspective properties. Thank you. Hi, so we just have a few minutes for you to respond if you want to say anything. Sure. Um, how many minutes would you have? Let's say five. Okay. Um, I want to thank Javier for his comments. Um, I'll try and do just sort of touch on a few of them. I uh, apologize to everybody that we weren't able to discuss the mysterious and secret of last section of the paper, um, but we can do some of the other things. So one thing I want to do is clarify something that I think wasn't very clear in the paper, which is the and the sort of difference in um, the difference between egocentric properties and perspectival properties. So perspectival properties, whatever they're supposed to be, should constitute an actual kind, whereas egocentric properties as a class don't necessarily constitute a natural kind. There's no deep explanatory unity to different egocentric properties. So at some point, uh, Pavier says, maybe we should explain the perspectival character of perception in terms of egocentric properties. And then I take that to be going over to the egocentric properties approach instead of the perspectival properties approach, because it doesn't offer a sort of unified and general account of the perspectival perception in terms of some basic psychological capacity. Now, I think an anactivist account which explains perception in terms of sensory motor knowledge could be just fine with taking on egocentric properties approach. In fact, uh, I think it probably should, for some reasons I'll touch on, uh, but I think it doesn't save the perspectival properties approach to say that we represent surface orientation and angular properties, things like that. doesn't get you that unified explanation. Now, um, Javier uh, looks, focuses a lot on Alvin Noe's view. Um, my I should say my intention wasn't to engage primarily with Alvin Noe, although I do sort of follow from his notion of what perspectival properties are. I think there are other good notions. Jonathan Cohen gives a dispositional account, which sort of tells you what the difference, what perspectival verticality is as opposed to perspectival circularity. Um, Michael Humer gives an account similar to Noe's, but Michael Humer is sort of uh, committed to Noe's inactivist picture of perception. Um, so I didn't want to focus entirely on Noe, but I think there are some things to be said uh, about Noe. So I think Javier makes a good point, which is that if my objection is Surely within a Marian framework about what the visual system looks like, the combination of Noe and Mar sort of makes for bad, bad things. Because Noe is much more of a Gibsonian, spends a lot more time focused upon our perception of what things can do for us um, than information processing or computational accounts of representations and intrinsic properties. So I take the point that we shouldn't mix Noe and Mar. I think there are still problems with Noe and Gibson in the claims that we represent projective properties. Um, well, so, so the anachronist approach or the Gibsonian idea is something like we only perceive affordances or ways that objects can be used or things that they can do for us. Um, so if the claim is Noe's claim is that we represent perspective properties, or in his case, that we represent projective properties, um, then it 
must be that projective properties are affordances. Like, they aren't afford, they aren't ways that objects can be used. They are projections that objects have on a plane, according to Noe's own definition. So it doesn't seem like there's a happy um, consistency between his own view and his, his claim that he also has, which is that we represent projective properties. Actually, this is a point that Walter Hopp points, uh, talks about in his paper, No Such Look. He thinks that Albert Noe, Albert Noe's account has this big tension. He says, Albert Noe says we perceive these projective properties, um, but what it is to perceive according to Noe is to know how things, how the different ways things look like as you move around and interact with them. But projective properties don't have different ways they look. They only look one way, and as you move, you get different projective properties. Um, so do we not perceive them because we don't have any non-trivial sensory motor knowledge of projective properties? Or is, that we per is it that we perceive them more directly, and this direct kind of perception doesn't require perception of affordances or sensory motor contingencies? I think there's a sort of internal consistency in Noe's account. I think actually Noe should be better off to give up the pieces that we represent projective properties to adopt the egocentric properties approach um, for, for these reasons. Um, so I'll end with that because I'm a bit over time, but I just wanted to thank, thank you again, Javier, uh, for the comments and thank the conference organizers for all now and setting themselves. Thank you. Take some questions, or whatever. Oh, yeah, we're, we're, we have to turn the order. Thank you. There, I don't know, let me just try to do it a little better. So you can see. That's great. So we'll take questions. Buenos Sebas. So, um, thank you. I paper a lot, but um, you try to put in the same sack, uh, the same bag. Uh, it's a direct spice relationship. Yeah. It's not good. Um, different approaches with regard to uh, perspectival properties. And I'm a bit puzzled about the idea of um, the problem that you, that you present. If I understand my idea, the dialectic is, look, the perspectival properties has this property, uh, so, sorry, this problem, and the uh, egocentric property approach does not have it, and can solve the other Now, the question whether something is functionally redundant uh, depends on the original motivation. So, and when I was looking at the, the reference that you mentioned, you have uh, Shoemaker and, and Egan there. So, they start postulating uh, these kind of properties uh, in order to explain the phenomenal character. You say. So, I take for granted that I have uh, this kind of experience. Now, I, what I want to do is to explain or provide an account of the phenomenal character in terms of uh, correctness conditions or content, and then uh, Egan goes and says, you know, given the possibility of inverted spectrum, if you want to uh, set aside metaphysical uh, possibilities, cases of sister spectrum, so differences in the way in which we perceive color depending on, on age or on sex or on race, uh, and we want to provide a characterization of those experiences in terms of correctness conditions, then here you have uh, a two. Uh, and in that sense, I don't see how, what would they say? They say, you know, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe you're right for, for these questions, but that doesn't touch my, my account at all. And now, so, and maybe for that reason, it would be more convenient for your purposes to take this position apart. And now one might try, or let me try to turn this into a kind of objection to your proposal. So, uh, okay, if we have this capacity, so if we do represent these perspectival properties, why what is not redundant is the other thing. So, you know, I represent perspectival properties if, big if, all right? If Sumaker and Egan are right, so, uh, yeah. So, for me to make sure I have the um, question up, so I, I took it your thought was what's redundant is relative to what your explanatory interests are. So, you're trying to explain how the phenomenal character of perception depends on representational properties, 
and it's not redundant to appeal to prospect either representation. It does substantive explanatory work in explaining the thing that you're trying to explain. Is that the idea? Yeah. So uh, I wanted to make reference to a specific kind of redundancy that I was interested in, namely that these representations would be functionally redundant from the perspective of visual information processing. So I think it's right. They, they wouldn't be useless to explain all these things that you and Shoemaker want to explain. They would be not, it wouldn't be explanatorily redundant in those cases. But I think it should be a condition on any empirical hypothesis, and I think these are empirical hypotheses, about what psychological capacities we have, about what we represent, um, that the representations uh, fit into our picture, into our best picture of visual information processing, and how the psychology works computationally. And so the claim is that from the computational perspective, um, from an information processing perspective, these representations wouldn't do anything. So maybe they explain these other things, but at the cost of um, not playing any role in information processing. And I thought, um, I guess an assumption of my argument is, is the condition on being a good explanation of these other things, that it did not be, um, that, it, that it contribute also to our understanding of the information processing stories we tell in psychology. Yeah, so but the, the, the worry in this case is you have to explain that the way in which we represent the world uh, differs from uh, person to person depending on macular uh, pigmentation. Now, the way in which this can be done, if we want to say for representationalism, and there are the reasons, so you mentioned here, uh, that we should avoid posting functionally redundant psycholo psychological uh, representations, but if we want to say for representationalism, and maybe your, your attack is there, so okay, give up representationalism, that would be, if we want to do that, then uh, we, we need to appeal to these properties if the arguments are right. Uh, and then what would be your answer? Say you, okay, give up representationalism and then postulate, uh, I don't know. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I have been thinking about some of those debates about a representationalism in color, sort of what, what the content of color perception is, even all the tremendous variation. Um, I guess my thought is, there's a substantial burden on the account to show how these representations fit into the computational story of into computational psychology. Uh, that doesn't mean that automatically you should reject the account. So if there are alternative accounts that can do the work um, without positive functionally redundant capacity, that's great. So in this case, I thought, well, there are alternative accounts. Evan thought so much about what you say in the you know, the, the eating shoemaker, the, these questions about color perception, which are a bit more specific, um, and the variation between people and variation in the same person over different ages. But I haven't thought about whether there are good alternative accounts. If there aren't, then maybe we should adopt the view. But I think in, in this debate that I'm looking at, there are alternative accounts which aren't committed to these functional, these redundant things. So, just the last, so. Sure. And then, so. Why, why not focusing? I mean, you, I think that your paper is interesting enough if you don't take all these uh, considerations into account and just fight uh, those positions that are committed to, to these things and leave th people that are working on color or on the phenomenal character aside uh, because then you don't have to commit yourself to this other stuff. And I think that this will simplify your line of argument uh, and still keeping it interesting enough. So it's just. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Any more questions, anyone? No? Yeah, Francois? Well, actually, I, I, you didn't mention the ventral and dorsal systems in your talk, so do you think that might be relevant? And another thing is. Uh, you think that might be, I mean, not only perception is perspectival, but language is also perspectival, and for language also we have distinction with, between layers of content that's somehow similar. And so people like Egan has written about both topics, and I think that may not be a coincidence, so I don't know whether you have any idea of an extension of your approach to language issues. 
So, um, let me try to press you a little bit on the issue of redundancy. So, if I want to get information about an object that is moving, I get information through the visual system and through the auditory system. Those might get, might not get the same information, but you know, when you design a system, sometimes re redundancy is useful. So, because in case one system fails, you still want. So, I don't know, Does any, do you feel any pressure from this idea? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I agree, there's, there's a lot of cases in, the, in perception where you want redundant coding, because yeah, one thing fails here. Usually that has to do with the sort of uh, how many representations you have in case one representation fails, you can rely on the other, you can average the contributions to the button. Um, in this case, I think, so, well, if the one fails, the other will do the job. But it's, in this case, because I think it's the architecture of the perception system, it's the whole computational set, the sorts of operations that are carried out, which ensures that you only represent objects that could have projected the input image. If that fails, then having this other representation isn't going to help you. The entire perceptual system will have sort of failed in a massive, massive way. So I think it's, it's not the sort of redundancy. Um, which is helpful for the visual, which is functional for the visual system. Okay. Thanks. Anyone else? If not, we have, um, we want to thank our speaker, our commentator. Thank you very much for reading. <laughs> um, we have a like, five minutes break before the next session. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>